Hi, my name is Paul Sargent. Welcome once again to AP Euro Bit by Bit, the series in which I try and break modern European history down into small bite-sized pieces so you can better understand it. Today, we're going to take a look at what are known as the new monarchies of the 15th and 16th centuries. What are those new monarchies? Well, let's take a look. All right, so just a bit of background here. So monarchies had started to really develop in Western Europe starting in the late Middle Ages when these monarchs, these royal families, started to consolidate power. Power prior to that had been sort of divided up so that nobles had lots of power and the kings had not so much. But there's a gradual process in which power is taken away from the nobles and centralized in the king and in the royal family. Now these monarchs are the foundation of the modern nation state. It's important to understand a couple of things though. Number one, they were not absolute monarchs. Absolute monarchies don't come along until a little bit later. These people were not able to achieve that level of control. And number two, they don't actually have nation states at this period either. They're trying to move towards it, but there's not a national identity yet in places like France and England and Spain and Portugal. They don't have a national identity and see themselves as Spaniards and Englishmen and all of that. So in order to investigate these new monarchies, we're going to look at a few things. Number one, we're going to look at the strategies they used in order to consolidate power. Number two, we're going to look at differences in success between Eastern and Western Europe. And number three, we're going to take a closer look at Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain and see how they went around about consolidating the power in their monarchy in order to lay the foundation for a Spanish empire. All right, so characteristics of the new monarchies. Now, these guys did a few things in order to try and gain power over the nobility. Number one, they decided that they were going to reduce the power of nobility through taxation and through the use of more stable enlistment armies. Gone are the days of the Middle Ages where, where knights had to train for an entire lifetime in order to be able to fight battles and had to put out enormous amount of money for, for armor and for horses and for weapons and stuff like that. Now, with the advent of the English longbow and other pieces of military equipment, almost anybody could be trained to be a successful soldier. And those people who are working for pay are no longer part of the, nobil of the noble class. They can come from almost any class. Number two, the new monarchs tried to reduce the power of the clergy. Reducing the power of the church uh, inside of the country would move allegiance away from the Catholic Church and on to the monarch itself and the idea of a burgeoning national identity. And that can be very important. Number three, these monarchs are going to take power away from the nobility who are the traditional advisors to the king. They're going to give that power increasingly to bureaucracies. They're going to hire people from the middle class in these growing towns around Europe in order to fill those positions. And those people are going to be paid and they're going to be loyal to the king, not loyal to their family and the titles like the nobility is. Finally, number four, they're going to separate their dependence on the nobility for the number one thing, which is money, taxation, which the nobles had been able to do. In order to do this, monarchies are going to increasingly try and take out loans from the major banks which are arising around Europe, especially the Medici. And as they do this, they're going to increase the debt that their country owes to those banks. Now this backfires in some cases. It's good for the bankers because the bankers get to some, some influence into royal politics. But it's bad for the bankers because ultimately there's no way for them to collect on those loans. Many of these monarchs are going to default on their loans and basically challenge the Medici and other banking families to come and collect. Because you know what? The kings have the armies. The Medici, the bankers, they don't. So is there opposition to this? Absolutely. All of the groups who are losing power, the nobility and the church, are gonna, were going to go and work against these monarchies because they wanted to maintain the power that they had. And the towns, which were increasingly becoming uh, indebted to the monarchs, were going to fight this as well because they were losing some of their autonomy and their ability to do things on their own. And yet, what we're going to find in Western Europe is that this is a very successful move. All right, so 
Generally, you can say that these monarchies are more successful in consolidating their power in Western and Northern Europe than they were in Eastern Europe. We're talking about Spain, Portugal, France, and England. This is rather successful in those places. But as you move east, as you go to the Holy Roman Empire, as you go further east than that, it's less successful. Keep that in mind. And even though we have a Holy Roman Empire in what, would, what will become Germany, it's not really holy. holy, it's not really Roman, and it's not really an empire. It's a bunch of small princedoms that all kind of elect one person who calls himself the Holy Roman Emperor. So not all that consolidated. All right, so that's it for the new monarchies. Hope you understand that. If you do, please subscribe so that you get notified when I have new videos. So until next time, now my name's Paul Sargent. This is AP Euro Bit by Bit. Thanks for watching.